today's guest is Austin Keenan from Keenan Slabworks. How are you doing? Doing very well, Steve. How's it going? Good, good, good. Hey, why uh, why don't you tell us about your business? How'd you get started? Tell sure. us the origin story. Uh, we started back in 2017, February of 2017. Um, before that, my dad had been looking to retire. Uh, he's been an attorney for over 30 years in Pennsylvania. He always liked um, dabbling in woodworking, wanted to do something where he's outside. Um, so we thought this would be a good option for him. It was only supposed to be a hobby. <laughs> it, was, it was never supposed to grow into a business, yeah. or a website, and you know we're getting paid to mill for people or dry their wood or build stuff for them. Um, it was solely supposed to be for him to make little, you know, like jewelry boxes, um, small items like that. But when we um, did our first log removal, it was a pretty big black walnut that we picked up from a town nearby. Um, we realized pretty quickly that we didn't have any of the equipment that you would need to do any sort of urban log removals. Um, we didn't even have a mill. We were renting a chainsaw. Um, from a rental facility nearby and trying to hack our way through some of these, you know, <laughs> these logs getting started. We had no idea the differences in chainsaw chains or anything. So we, we made a, we kind of butchered a, a couple of the initial first logs, but we had people. Come Did you have a chainsaw mill? We bought a real cheap one off of, uh, off of Amazon. I think it was a hundred bucks. And we learned very quickly that that was, <laughs> pretty labor intensive pretty expensive. oh my god that's a young man's game that's the way i like it <laughs> yeah if you got a chain if you have a chainsaw mill that's like i mean that's a ton of work it's not efficient but yeah you're right it kind of shows some initiative though i mean like you guys you saw you're like hey this is going to be a hobby so you must have been exciting to just be able to just jump in like this right oh it was fantastic it's something new um, we're both very um, learning driven. We're, we're motivated to learn new things continuously. And I think that's why we've been able to develop this business is because we're always looking to learn something new. Um, and that chainsaw milling was just something new to learn. You know, like I said earlier, we had no idea what's, you know, the differences in the chains that we were gonna be using, but um, we made it work. And we realized pretty quickly that we would need a bandsaw mill. So then we progressed to, you know, doing a lot of research into the different mills that were out there, ended up purchasing one. And of course, there's a pretty steep learning curve when, whenever you try to learn a new skill like that. But after we got the bandsaw mill, um, people came out because they wanted to use it. They'd never seen a bandsaw um, before. And we were real open with people coming out. We'd toss a log on there and, you know, show them what we knew and let them go to town. Um, and the word got out and people started asking to buy material from us for their own projects. And then it just sort of snowballed from there. Oh. So, you're, so, you're, so your dad was retired. What were you doing? Oh, no, he wasn't retired. This was, uh, oh, anyway. this was his plan after he would eventually retire. He just retired. Um, he's got one case left that he's waiting on a couple pieces of paper to come back from the court. And then he, he'll be officially retired. But what about what about you? What were you doing? <laughs> um, I was selling cars actually uh, nearby, um, Volkswagen and BMW. And um, eventually, I became a paralegal for about uh, I think three years. I was doing that, and this was just okay. our hobby thing on the side. Wow, going into sort of like a hobby business. So we were. You know, we had our day jobs that we were using some of the funds from those to finance our hobby, and then our hobby took over. <laughs> so when when was it a thing? When did it become a thing? So so wait, you got the chainsaw, then you got a bandsaw. What kind of bandsaw did you get? Uh, it's a small company out of Missouri called Easy Boardwalk. Oh yeah, lots of people. Because I I met some people. What what did you think of that? Why did you pick that? So at the time, and you have to remember, this is back in, it would have been February of 2018. Um, at that time, 
the Easy Boardwalk Model 40 was the largest capacity bandsaw mill uh, for under $10,000. Um, even for under, uh, I think if you went under 14, it was still the largest at that time. Um, this is before the Woodmiser LX150 came out, and I think it's before the Cook's 52-inch uh, wide slabber mill came out. Um, and we weren't looking for anything with hydraulics. Um, quite frankly, we couldn't afford it at that time. We just wanted something with the biggest cut capacity that we could find um, so that we could do these live edge projects. That's sort of our niche. We don't do any um, any dimensional pieces or any joinery or stuff like that. And we thought the, the easy boardwalk would be a good fit. We got it delivered and we've been using it ever since. Um, it's a very well-constructed mill. Um, and if anybody's looking for a decent hobby mill, that's a, that's a good one to check out. Uh, we really liked that the, um, the log deck was a single piece. It wasn't bolted together. Um, and everything on the mill was basically turnkey. You just put a blade on and you're good to go right from the factory. There's no assembly. Um, there's no parts to get lost. Um, there's no calibrating this or that. There's no even putting belts on anything. Everything is ready to go. Um, and I remember- How much research did you do before you, you pulled the trigger? And so, like, why that one versus another another comparable mill? So we learned very quickly that chainsaw milling was extremely expensive because we were renting that saw um, and that it took forever to get anything done. So we were chainsaw milling for about two to three months before I realized that one, we either needed a more powerful saw or two, we need a bandsaw. So I was researching bandsaws for about nine months before we finally um, purchased this easy boardwalk model 40. Um, I went with that one because all the other mills that were in, you know, the, the $10,000 and, and lower price point um, had a cut capacity of around 28 inches. Okay. And the, the easy boardwalk model 40 can do, well, they claim it can do 34. They can cut a 34 inch wide board. They can handle a 40 inch wide log. Yeah. So that's why we went with that one. Basically that's same, great. Price, it's completely assembled and it cuts bigger. So you start, so you started, you got the mill, you started milling. How'd you get the word out? Was it just more word of mouth or what, what was it going on there? Well, I had no intentions of developing it into a business. I just thought it was something cool that we were doing as a hobby. And a lot of my friends that came over thought it was cool too. So I would post a photo to my personal Facebook account, you know, every now and then when we would do something. And a lot of people seemed really interested in it. Um, and I was speaking with a customer. He, he was a wood turner. And I, he, he actually is from the town that I live in. Um, and he said, well, hey, you should try selling some of your slabs on Facebook Marketplace. Yeah. You know, and at the time, I had no idea what that was. I didn't know how to use it. So, of course, it was something new to learn. And we made a listing. Uh, we had milled, I think it was 60 or 70 black walnut slabs. And I photoed, okay. I photoed the bulls and I photoed some individual slabs I thought looked cool and, you know, just kind of put it out there. And that was uh, like April or May of 2018. Yeah. It was the first marketplace listing we had ever done. And back then it would tell you, marketplace would tell you how many people viewed your listing. So you could you would have a little bit of data to work with to see which listings were working well and which ones weren't. And that one got 20,000 views in less than a day. Oh. So I was wow. like, oh, this, this is incredible. This is free marketing right here. And I had, I was getting messages sent to me like every three to five minutes. I had to put my phone on silent when I went to bed at night and I woke up and I had like a hundred messages that I had to respond to all from, you know, this tool that um, I didn't even know existed. So we started doing that, making some, uh, some more listings on Marketplace and people started coming out and buying stuff from us. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. We're, you know, we get to be outside. We get to mill some, some wood. We get to see what's on the inside of these logs. And then people are coming out and actually giving us money for them. It, it's it's kind of cool. I mean, we might have something here. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it, uh, it, it took off from there. Um, word got out and we started, we did, we made a website. Um, we did some uh, research into SEO and, and tried to tailor our buzzwords that we would come up first in Google searches uh, and things like that. We made a designated uh, business Facebook page, um, invited everybody to come do it. And a lot of people shared it. We uh, claimed our Google listing. Um, so when people would actually search a business page would, would show up, it would link to our website. We would have a lot of photos on, on there that people could view you know, what, we, what we do. Um, and it's grown from there. And we have been looking to get into uh, different networking groups around the area. Uh, we were a member, a guest member of one in a, a, a city about 45 minutes away that worked out really well. And we still get some contacts from those members regarding urban log removals. Um, and we've gotten a couple referrals from them for um, different table builds, bar builds, things like that. Um, because we progressed from just selling the slab to, to actually finishing the pieces for people too. That was a new thing to learn as well. <laughs> so you you created a business from scratch. Yeah. Yep. Um, my parents own a uh, a twenty acre um, like hay field with with some wooded area on it in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And my dad and I. Um, decided that we were going to use one of the areas for our log area and our sawmill and, and all of that. And that's sort of become the, the official spot for the business. But it was honestly just a, a grass hay field. And now it's a, now it's a business five years later. Um, so talk about all the different services that you do. So you said you do some finishing work. Um, you do log removal. What else are you doing? We do everything from removing a log once it's been felled from somebody's property to milling it, to drying it in our vacuum kiln, to having it planed down flat. We work with a nearby furniture manufacturer as a 53 quite abrasive planer. So we take all of our slabs up to them after they come out of the kiln and we get them back, um, you know, usually a week or two later. At that point, we offer finishing services so we can build you know, tables, bar tops, any flat surface for people. Um, I know how to weld. I learned how to weld 10 or 15 years ago. So we can steal bases for people as well. We're getting into epoxy work. Um, so we've been making some, we've been filling small cracks and voids with epoxy. We've been getting more requests for river tables. So that's something that we're gonna try to learn how to do and see if it's something we wanna get into. Awesome. Um, we also do deliveries too. Yeah. Um, we actually, we were delivering an oak, a single slab oak table we built for a family nearby. Um, it was, I think, 10 foot, nine inches long. It was about 47 on the narrow end width and 51 or 53 on the wide end. And it was two and a half inches thick. It was just a monster of a slab and we could lift it up and move it for about 10 feet. And then we had to put it down. Um, so we had to develop a way to safely move these giant slabs into people's homes. And, you know, my dad's getting older. He, he's pretty much retired now. He's about 65. Um, and it, it's not really safe to be trying to carry 300, 400 pound slabs up steps and around corners and whatnot. So we did some research into different, um, ways to move these slabs and I, I saw a couple ideas for drywall carts and granite carts where these companies move these giant granite slabs and we took some of the yeah. they had and made a a tilt table on wheels that um is narrow enough that it'll fit through a standard doorway but then it tilts so that we can actually put a five foot wide slab on it and go through a doorway and we have oh, yeah that's on that's on your instagram i see it it's yeah pretty cool we have a uh, we have jacks on each end of it too so that we can actually wheel that that cart into our work area raise the slab up and then lower it down onto you know like saw horses 
if we need to. Um, so that was something that we, we put together because we had a need for it. Uh, and we haven't used it for anyone's home yet. Uh, there are a couple bugs or tweaks that I need to work out on it, but it's been, it's been working pretty well for the two tables that we're currently using it on. But yeah, we can, so that all gets back to the transport these slabs and put them into people's homes. That's exciting. Austin, that's really, really cool. What, uh, what do you think was the thing that made this real for you? Like, what was that moment? And are you, are you doing this full-time now? Yeah, yeah, uh, I've been doing it full-time for about a year and a half. Um, the video was kind of cut now. Did you say, what, what, like, when was it? made it real for you. Real? Um, yeah. I think it was, it wasn't like a definite light bulb moment. It was something that I always wanted to do. And it just got to the point where I would wake up in the morning and I'm, I was thinking, oh, well, what are we going to mill today? Or what project are we going to work on? Or, or what do I have to weld? Or are we removing a log? Or that was like where my mind went when it was um, thinking about what I had to do during the day. And I realized that I wanted to do this <laughs> more than any other work I'd done in the past, teaching, selling cars, paralegal office work, you know, this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I spoke with my dad about it and I said, hey, look, you know, I want to do this full time. Um, and he was on board with it and he now does it, even though he's retired, he does it full time too because <laughs> he likes it so much. He, he really enjoys the finished work. And um and doing the log removals, things like that. But I think it was more of a, a, a slow development to the point where I realized this is what I want to do rather than a light bulb moment. Was there, was there a job or a customer or a project that you worked on that you were like, you know, maybe it's not a light bulb moment, but you're like, oh my God, this is real, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, there was. Um, <clears throat> most recently, it was this past Christmas, um, or actually around uh, Thanksgiving time, we had a customer, he called my, my phone, he called the business phone, and he said, hey, you know, I'm looking for um, a tabletop, or a table, it's got to be 15 feet long, it's going in my dining room. So 15 feet, I mean, it's <laughs> a huge dining room, all right. I'll see if I have something that long, you know, and we did. We had, uh, we had two very large oak slabs um, that we were going to use for this table build. He wanted it 15 feet long. And if I re remember correctly, it had to be a minimum of 48 inches wide the whole way. So this was by far the biggest project we had ever worked on and, and still is the biggest project we ever worked on. Um, and one of the challenges in that project, other than just the immense size and weight of, of this piece, is that he needed a custom steel base for it with a subframe that only had two legs. So we had to span that full, um, basically 12 feet out of the 15 feet with, with no center support. So we had to design a steel base for all that and we eventually got it done. Um, it also required just over, if I remember correctly, just over three gallons of epoxy to fill all the cracks and the voids in these slabs. He wanted the gnarliest looking slabs that we, we could find in his size. Um, and the oak slabs that we found had a lot of- And you were like, great. I was like, I, I, it was one of those points where I wasn't sure if we would be able to do it. Um, but we always have to find a way to say yes. And it was a challenge that we took on and we were able to get it done. Um, it was a tremendous amount of work um, to get it done. He needed it Christmas Eve, he was having a party. And we got it back from being planed like two weeks before that and we had to do epoxy and we had to mount it on the base and, and everything um, and make sure that everything fit perfectly before we drove over and tried to get it in, into his house. Um, but when, when we got it there, um, the owner of the table, the guy we built the table for actually owns a furniture company. 
And it was kind of kind of funny that he was asking us to build something for him. Uh, but that was the moment where I realized that, you know, we could really, we could, we could do this. You know, we're not limited to doing coffee table size pieces, you know, with hairpin legs. We can do these big, massive projects. We can take it on. We have the capability and the drive and the motivation to actually get it done. That's exciting. That was a good story. Yeah. It, it was really cool to, uh, you know, to, to get that delivered and put in his room. Uh, in his dining room and and realized that we had we had met our deadline on time um you know everything went perfectly and and he was really happy with it you know i i think about sometimes the most beautiful pieces end up being the one that require the most work right it's kind of like it's kind of like life and business right it's like the most hard the hardest things ever end up being the things that you have to put the most amount of work in you know like or the piece that's like i mean those those big slabs with those gnarls and voids you're like oh my god there's a lot of potential but that's gonna be a lot of work to get that to be really really beautiful mm -hmm. um so that's awesome what's like so I'm assuming was last year a good year for you this past year? It, uh, in some areas and then in other areas, it was a little below average. Um, slab sales increased this past year. That was going pretty well because a lot of people were home. They couldn't do anything. So they wanted a hobby. At least that's what you know our customers told us when they came out. <clears throat> um, kiln drying was very good this past year. We were booked out. At the beginning of the year, we, were, we had a six-month lead time. Um, we developed a lot of contacts with different construction companies as far away as, uh, well, let's just say about a two hour radius. Um, and then building projects for people, um, took off. What kind of lulled was log removals. Um, a lot of the tree companies weren't in operation. So, uh, we weren't getting calls about taking down oak trees or walnuts or, or, any other type of uh, type of wood, uh, which was fine. You know, we we maintain an inventory of about three hundred logs, um, in addition to our slab inventory. But it's a lot of work to receive the log. Yeah, we've uh, we started out with a, um, uh, a log arch, similar to the one Macromona made, uh, a little bit different but similar. So that's how we were originally getting all of our logs. Um, now we purchased a track loader, a John Deere track loader. So we can actually just go in and pick up basically eight, I think eight or 9,000 pounds. Real quickly, the down parts were log removals because the tree companies, um, weren't working and that was pretty much it. Oh, uh, milling for, uh, for other customers because trees weren't getting dropped. We weren't getting calls about milling logs for people. Everything which is fine, which is fine because you could focus on your own, selling your own inventory too, right? You could use that milling time for yourself, right? Correct. We had different revenue streams coming in. So that wasn't, um, you know, a nail in the coffin for us. For sure. Um, so what's the future hold for you? Um, next step is we're going to have a designated uh, building. We're putting up probably either a 36 by 60 or um, a 40 by 72 um, post and beam building. Uh, and that will serve as a dirty room for doing like all the sanding and prep work on, on our projects for people. It will also have a clean room for doing the epoxy pours and the finish work. Uh, it's gonna have a metal working area for the table bases that we would build. It's also gonna have um, a retail area. So we're gonna start to build some tables that aren't commissioned because that right now that's all we do is commission pieces um so that we can be able to show people what we're able to do yeah and then um there'll be some storage spaces in there for dried slabs um that have been dried and plain for people to purchase that don't want us to do the finished work that's great you know um i don't know if you've listened to other podcasts but the, a, a big piece of advice that everybody always says is always get a bigger, always get something bigger because you'll always, 
Yeah, like just when you're like, oh, I should have went bigger. Like, I mean, I, because you'll always find a need for it, you know? So, um, cool. So I don't know if you, in other episodes, um, there's a part where I help you and give you any marketing or business advice. And so is there a, uh, is there something that you're needing to think through marketing or business wise um, that I could, that I could help you with? Um, when I'm, this might be a little specific, but what I'm having some difficulty with is trying to link products that we have available for sale on our Instagram page. Mm -hmm. It was an option that Instagram keeps bugging me about, but I can't seem to figure out how to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I need to, I, I recognize that I need to spend more time um, an effort into developing content for social media that people want to watch, mm -hmm. um, not just scroll past. And I think that if we were able to like hone those, hone and develop those skills that we would be able to grow our, um, our business and be able to sell more products and, and services to people. So if there, if you have any advice on that aspect, um, you know, how to develop, uh, you know, vid video editing skills and, and incorporating music and, and all that, um, I think that would be a huge help to us. So the, the challenge that you're thinking about is like, how do you build a good sort of overall skill set around creating content to build up your brand? Is that, is that kind of sound right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll, I'll look at your Instagram. So I'll look um, and I'll just kind of give feedback as to what I see um, really quickly. For one is, um, is uh, for all of the different parts of your business, you should have different highlights. So if you look at Instagram, so like, you know, we tend to focus on Instagram here. It's the same that could be for Facebook, but look at your highlights. So I would put kiln drying as a highlight. I would put finished work as a highlight. I would put slabs for sale and any slabs that you have for sale, put it as a highlight, right? And um, I would just hi put highlights there. The other thing too is again, um, you know, one of my old clients and now my uh, business partner in Olag and Epoxy is Jake. One of the things that I worked with Jake on was like, just treating your Instagram story like a TV show every day and just get on and, and every day record and see if you can record it natively on your phone. So like record it on your phone in one minute increments and then upload it later. Don't just hit record in Instagram stories, right? Because once you have it on your phone as like one off, then you can go back and edit it and then play around. If you wanna get good at like editing software, there's a good app called InShot, I-N-S-H-O-T. That's a really good uh, uh, video editing software. It has music in it, built in already. It, it's really, really awesome. The other thing, is um, when it's on your phone, then you can put, you can add photos, you can add video, you can add transit. It's really easy and intuitive. And it's actually quite a bit of fun in order to do it. The other thing is um, an app. So like a bunch of, so I noticed this. So like we had this guy named JML Woodcraft. He mentioned what, what photo editing he uses. And next thing you know, I, I noticed other people started editing, but there's an app called Snapseed that you can just, and because you know how you look at this beautiful piece of like a beautiful slab and you're like, and you take a picture of it and you're like, wait, what I took a picture of is not what I see. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so That's Snapseed helps to bring it to actually what you see, right? And it's not like, and it's so you can add filters, you can edit it, you can just do all these different things to it to just tweak it to make your, your pictures pop. And there's something about the Instagram algorithm that allows you to, um, if a photo has like a certain quality, it just, I don't, I don't know what it does, but it, 
it shows to more of your audience, right? So that, that's one thing. So is add story highlights and you can use an app called Canva to create highlights. It's like a free graphic design software, C-A-N-V-A. So you can do that. Um, so add your highlights, record every day. Say, hey, this is Austin from Keenan Slabworks. Um, this is what I'm working on today. And you just go around and you, like, like you hold up your phone and you record in one minute increments. You know how you hit record mm -hmm. and then you can hit stop. As soon as you get to 58 seconds, hit stop because Instagram stories stops uploading after a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So just hit start and stop and then continue as you go along. So you'll have all these little one minute clips. And then also too, if you're recording in one minute clips, it forces you to be very clear and succinct. So you'll have to think through a little bit about what you're saying, right? And then the other thing too is turn the camera onto yourself, right? Turn the camera onto yourself and say what you're working on. Say, hey, I'm Austin. And that's probably one of the first things I would do is so like you have pictures of yourself in front of your work, but you should have a picture where you introduce yourself to your audience. Like, hey, you may be a new follower, but like, this is who I am. This is why I do. This is how we came to be. You know, if it's you and your dad, just take a picture of you and your dad. Hey, we're, you know, what's your dad's name? Jamie. Jamie. So like, hey, this is Austin and Jamie from uh, Keenan Slabworks. And this is our story. And you just put it in a cat, like a, in the caption. Um, and I would, there's different types of content that you can put out there. And so like, I mean, I have, you know, I have like courses and stuff, but like there's different types. There's like inspirational, there's testimonials, there's, um, you know, uh, motivational, there's like lessons learned, like all of those things, you should just document it. Like treat your life, at least your life in Keenan's Labworks as a reality TV show. Because what you'll end up doing is that you'll end up connecting with more and more people and people, people that engage in your stories end up seeing your posts more. What years ago, when I first started, even five years ago, it was just so easy to gain an audience. There's a reason why I have 165,000, 64,000 followers is because I started a while ago. I started five or six, I started five years ago. And so it was back then. And so like, if you look at like Canadian Woodworks, you know, Canadian Woodworks. Yeah, I follow him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got something like four or 500,000 followers because he literally was one of, he started Instagram when Instagram first started. And he was like, and he was like the featured woodworker on Instagram. So like he grew tremendous. It was, it was kind of like why people flock to TikTok because it's easy to get audience in new platforms. After a while, you got to work for it. But there's all these little tips and tricks. But one of the best ways to do that is to really just connect low, connect with your audience by speaking to them and giving, treat your Instagram profile and your Facebook profile like the storefront of your business. Does that make sense? It does. Like mindset wise, like treat it like it's the storefront of your business, you know? Oh, another highlight is reviews. So you have reviews, right? You could take screenshots of your reviews. You could take screenshots of your reviews and add that as a story. So then next thing you know, people are like, oh wait, what are their reviews? What are people saying about them? So then you're basically selling people before and people are sold before they contact you because they've already seen your work. Cool? Yes, it does. It's all good points. I, I was making notes when you were talking. That's why. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, this, this will be out too. So, but, but that's essentially, I mean, I would, the first thing, you know, the first thing I would do is just start recording every day. Just like, you know, if you want to get personal, if you really want to get personal, you know, you could bring in your family a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, like people, what, what I tend to find is, that the more personal you get, um, the more people feel attracted to you and you start attracting your right kind of people. It's like, all right, like, because it wouldn't it be better to do business with people that you really, that are attracted to you value-wise? 
I think that there would be um, maybe like a professional friendship that could be developed, you know, with people like that. Um, yeah. A couple of, I don't want to really go out there and say like a loyalty thing, but, you know, you, you develop a rapport with people and they're more likely to come back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I found that the more that I introduce and I tell more about my story, the more people connect with me. And that's essentially it, you know, so um, cool. So tell everybody how what's the best way to people for people to get in touch with you? Call myself in. <laughs> what about what about your uh, what about your in, what's your Instagram and website? Uh, Instagram is at Keenan Slab Works. K-E-E-N-A-N, Slab Works. Uh, website's the same thing, KeenanSlabWorks.com. Um, and our Facebook's the same. They're all the same. Awesome. Any last bit of parting advice for the Woodpreneur community? Yes. Um, don't ever become complacent with where you are. Um, always, always, always be thinking, how can I improve? How can I get better? What service can I offer to grow my business? Or is there a need in, in my local community that I can fill with my skill sets or business? Um, it seems that sometimes businesses just sort of get comfortable with where they are. And when something comes along like this pandemic did with everybody, some businesses failed um, because they weren't able to adapt to it. They weren't able to, to overcome it. So um, I know when it when it when that pandemic started for us, we were kind of worried if people would actually be able to come out and buy slabs from us. So we we switched and realized that and, and started putting more effort into, you know, Instagram and, and Facebook and um, the Facebook marketplace and offering delivery and you know mask this and hand sanitizer that. Um, but yeah, that that's my biggest. Um, I think my biggest lesson we've ever learned is just never becoming complacent, always having that drive, that motivation to get better. Awesome. Austin, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. Um, congrats on your, on your, the birth yeah, of your baby fun. boy. <laughs> yeah. 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 For those of you Declan, that shout out to Declan, Declan's yeah. first shout out in the world on the yeah. podcast <laughs> Born on the 21st. So we're going to pick him awesome. up today. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, happy for you and excited for the growth of your business. Thank you very much, Steve. Have a good one. I right, talk to you soon. Bye.